Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from the lunch break, and welcome to this uh, talk. OK. Welcome to this talk, uh, which is about uh, misconfigurations in uh, hand charts and how far are we from automated uh, detection and mitigation. And uh, today with me, there is Agat. So, hello everyone. So, my name is Agat Blaise. I'm a research engineer working at Thales, and I'm mostly working on the virtualization of network system and the security of such systems. And uh, I'm Francesco, and I'm doing a PhD at the Free University of uh, Amsterdam. And a very brief uh, advertis advertisement uh, before we dive into the technical content. Uh, this work was actually part of a collaboration in a European project, Ashurmos, that just uh, finished, and a new project, sec for ai for sec I put the link uh, there, so we're always looking for uh, collaborations, especially with companies, if you're interested in the what we're doing, please uh, check it out. Um, so now diving into the uh, content of this talk, uh, which is misconfigurations in uh, the cloud, why should we care in the first place? Well, because from recent uh, reports, um, they found that uh, such misconfigurations can be the reason for several incidents, security incidents, and um, because they, uh, the containers that actually run uh, your applications, they also usually run for a very uh, limited time. So the, the runtime window for uh, detection and uh, mitigation is short. And so at the beginning, we, we started this work saying, OK, because we have this very limited time window at uh, runtime, let's see how much we can improve uh, before uh, reaching runtime, so at static time. Uh, and also, the other reasons were uh, uh, because there are a lot of uh, tools that can analyze configuration files, uh, hand charts as well. Uh, however, there are some inconsistencies between the uh, output of such tools. And also, there is no indication about whether a configuration might break the functionality of your application or not. Um, and because misconfigurations can uh, cause bad things, so to say, uh, there are some frameworks available that uh, give a list of uh, best practices and security recommendations that you should follow with your configurations. For example, the uh, SIS benchmark or the NSA and CISA hardening guides. And they, for example, suggest that you should not run your container uh, as root, minimize the capabilities, the Linux capability uh, you assign, uh, and so on. And uh, looking at an example, uh, on, uh, on the left of the slide, you can see a snippet of a YAML file that uh, can be used to deploy a deployment uh, resource uh, on a cluster. And uh, as you can see, there are uh, some misconfigurations that uh, tools are able to detect. For example, there are no resource constraints for this deployment, uh, which is also running as root. It's not using a read-only file system, and it can allow uh, to escalate. It can gain more privileges uh, than the ones it started with. Uh, so using tools, you can actually detect uh, these issues and eventually f uh, fix them. Uh, and some of them are uh, quite easy to fix. For example, it's a matter of flipping from false to true or, or the other way around. Other, uh, they require you to uh, actually write a new piece of configuration. For example, uh, they require you to add some limits and requests uh, for your memory and CPU uh, of your application. Uh, and so you can define, for example, memory equal to 64 megabytes, uh, which seems reasonable. However, whenever you are asked to, to add uh, a new piece into the configuration, you can also make a lot of uh, what if uh, questions. For example, what if we define memory equal Alice, or, or what if we define memory equal zero? Will this, this uh, new configuration be still accepted by a tool, uh, or will still be able to uh, deploy it on, on the cluster? So we were, this was our starting point uh, for, for this uh, work. And then we selected uh, some several uh, open source tools uh, available out there, uh, seven of them. Uh, most of them are part of the CNCF. Uh, and as you can see, they all have a different number of uh, policies available uh, by default. So the, the numbers are only uh, default policies that can be applied on uh, configuration files or uh, helm charts. 
And to evaluate uh, these uh, seven tools uh, on Helm charts, in this case, we built an automated pipeline. Uh, it's a pipeline has uh, six steps, you can see. Uh, it's freely available, so you can scan the code, you can also follow the link. I will show a brief demo of the pipeline uh, to check it out and also to try it. Um, and I will explain briefly the steps. Uh, so there is a st step zero, uh, is mapping the, the policies of the tools. This, uh, I have a slide later for this. So regarding the pipeline, the first step, it takes an e as input a configuration file, it can be a Helm chart, but also a YAML file that you manually have written. And it runs a tool to find uh, what misconfigurations there are in this file. At the second step, uh, we automatically fix all these misconfigurations. Uh, the third step is just a debug step to make sure that actually the fixing was done correctly, so the output of the, the, the first tool uh, will be zero, no remaining misconfigurations. Uh, step four, we generate a functionality profile. Uh, Agat will explain this uh, later um, more into detail, but basically we generate a list of the functionalities needed by your application. Step five, we add back uh, these functionalities that could have been removed uh, during the fixing. So it's an update of the configuration file. And finally, we run uh, another uh, tool to find the remaining uh, misconfigurations. So I will show uh, briefly the, uh, what the, the pipeline uh, looks like in practice. I hope you can read it. Uh, yes. Uh, so we implemented uh, as uh, GitHub Actions. So this is our uh, GitHub uh, repository. As you can see, there is the, the, all the list of folders. Uh, every folder is a Helm chart. However, it, we could also take as input uh, a YAML file, which is uh, not generated from a, a chart. And then we define the pipeline as Actions. So we can move to the Actions uh, tab, and uh, we can run a new workflow that uh, will allow us to actually uh, scan the file with uh, two tools and see what mi misconfigurations there are. And to do this, we can specify the file. In this case, we use the MySQL uh, chart, the first tool, and then we can specify another tool, for example, X. And then we click, we click uh, Run Workflow. Uh, we upload the page. Yes, and now it is uh, here running. We, you can also configure this to be automatically executed. So this workflow to be automatically executed uh, whenever there is an update in your configuration, so to avoid this manual uh, interaction. Uh, and without waiting for, for it to complete, we can look at the previous workflow uh, we run with the same output. Uh, and here you can see uh, the same steps that uh, were back in the slides. And uh, zooming in, uh, there is the first uh, step one, uh, running Chekhov uh, in this case, fixing the chart, running Chekhov again as a debug, adding the functionalities needed, and finally running kicks. We can further respect the output. And for example, for the MySQL uh, application, uh, MySQL chart, uh, Chekhov uh, found 21 uh, misconfigurations. Uh, for example, the default namespace is being used, which is a very well-known bad practice. So you get a, a sort of output like this, which of course you can also save uh, locally and further inspect it. Uh, there is step two, again, we fix all these mis misconfigurations, so in this case 21, and then we run Chekhov again, just as a control, and we can check that, so now, check off uh, run, and here you can see there are no more uh, misconfigurations. However, by removing all the misconfiguration, we can also, we could also have removed some permissions that are actually needed by MySQL. Uh, and for example, because it's a database, uh, you can imagine read-only file system will not uh, work in this case. So that, that is what we do at step five. Uh, we compute the, the permissions needed, and then we add it back into the configuration. And then at step, at step six, we uh, run, in this case, uh, kicks. So we, we can also expect uh, the output of this other tool. And uh, kicks actually find uh, more additional misconfigurations, for example, request uh, storage, uh, and also the read-only uh, 
which, however, we cannot remove because it's actually needed by, by the container. So switching back to the uh, presentation. OK. Uh, so step zero, I was mentioning at, at the beginning, uh, this happened before we built the pipeline. And it was needed because all such tools have different uh, policy types and definitions. Uh, so we needed a standardization of uh, over the whole uh, policies uh, from the different tools. Uh, also because there are some policies in common, some policies are equivalent uh, on the description, but they actually check for different uh, configuration keys in practice. And also there are different output formats. So if you want to count how many misconfigurations, you already have to adapt to the output of each tool. So you can see the table uh, show you some examples of um, what policies are in common uh, between all the tools, uh, and then policies in common between two of them, uh, and so on. And now we leave the floor to Agat uh, to explain a bit more about the functionality. Yeah, so Francesco just introduced uh, different policies that are handled by checker tools like Checkoff and Detri. And actually, each of these tools output hundreds of recommendations to fix the M chart and make the configuration more secure. So for, the, for example, for this example, you should uh, put this container as non-root. But however, we notice that every tool will have a different output format, and therefore this output must be manually parsed by administrators. Also, sometimes the output can be quite long to parse, with several thousands of lines to parse. Um, and another example is uh, when we will remove a functionality, it may break functionality. So for example, if we consider the Falco monitoring tool, it actually needs access to the host network and to be privileged, even if it is not secure. So it will raise many alerts from checker tools like Checkoff, but it is actually needed because it needs to analyze the network traffic, the system call from the containers, uh, and then we have to design one tool that will automatically identify the minimal set of permission that will be needed by the chart to function, and the permission that we cannot remove because otherwise the application will not function anymore. So I will now show you the tool that we developed. It's named the Functionality Oracle, and it enables to find the minimal set of functionalities that are needed by the application to function, uh, following the principle of least privilege. So as a first step, I will choose one M chart. It could be also a Kubernetes manifest or a JSON file, that, a YAML file that you design with your application. And you will run it in its default configuration, so with the permission granted by default as defined in the M charts. And you will have what we call the ground truth container because it contains uh, the given permission allowed. And in parallel, you will consider a list of permissions. So this permission will be outputted and uh, will be recommended by checker tools. Uh, for example, you can see uh, there is one recommendation to set the user as non-root, also to remove this given Linux capability or to disallow the privilege escalation. So the second step is to update and run the pod configuration without one given permission. For example, I will set the user running as done root. So this is step two. Uh, during step three, I will recover some indicators linked to the ground truth containers and the test containers. So first of all, I will collect and clean the stream of logs related to the ground truth container so with the given permission and from the test container so without the given permission. So I will collect and clean this stream of logs. And for the test container, I will also recover the status from the pods, the containers, and the props. So this is step three. And as a final step, I will test the functionality of the pod without the given permission. So this is step four. Uh, I, I have three uh, functionality test cases. I have first TC1. So TC1 is to check that container can st start without any errors. Uh, then, if TC1 is OK, I will check TC2. So during TC2, I will look to the liveness and readiness probes uh, of the pod and check that everything is OK. And finally, during step uh, TC3, uh, I will compare uh, semantically the logs from the ground truth container and from the test container and verify that uh, the application behaves the same way and therefore 
uh, if these three, uh, TC1, TC2, and TC3 test cases are okay, I will deduce that the permission was not needed at the end. If one of these test cases is failing, I will flag the permission as needed, and I cannot remove it as recommended by checker tools. So I will uh, repeat this process for each permission and input in the, ch in the chart. And finally, I will output what we call the functionality profile that you can see on the right. So it's a JSON document where for each permission, I will uh, say this permission can be removed uh, and it will uh, make the configuration more secure, but this one I need it for the application to function. So some example of functionality test case. So we have a data set of 60 M charts that we analyzed. So I will give several examples for each of the test case. So the first one, remember, was to check whether the container can start. So in a Kubernetes manifest or in a M chart, most of the time we define a startup command uh, along uh, the container configuration. And we will check that this uh, startup command can run successfully and without errors. So one example in our data set was uh, for the PL M charts. The startup command uh, consists in sending a curl request to the PL web server. And this command uh, will run successfully only if the se web service is up. So it's one way to verify the functionality. Then if this step is OK, I will go to TC2. And this time, check that the container resource is in running state. So especially, we look to the resource, so the pod or the deployment container, and look uh, that it uh, runs, it is in running state. Uh, so especially, we look to liveness and readiness props. So they are very useful because they can enable to test basic functionality of the application. And in most cases, they are already defined in the M chart that we used. So for example, the MySQL M chart had a readiness prop that will use the ping functionality from the MySQL admin um, executable. So with this command, I will uh, automatically check uh, that I can access the MySQL uh, service and it is accessible uh, with the root password. And finally, if these two test cases are okay, I will compare the logs. So first, I will clean the logs meaning that I will remove any numerical value and any context-related information. And then I will semantically compare the logs to see if the application behaves the same with and without the permissions. And in addition, I will also uh, check that the logs do not contain any keyword in a preset blacklist, like permission denied, operation not permitted, or uh, error. For example, uh, we had an example with uh, the Datadog N charts. So for this one, the container could start correctly. The liveness and readiness probes were actually OK. But when looking to the logs of the application, we can see that we actually modified the UID value. It enables to prevent the container to access uh, host files. And when I modify this UID value, I can see an error, permission denied error, because we cannot change the owner of the off token document. So this is one example of the output of the tool. Uh, it's called the functionality JSON profile. So here is an example for the Falco M charts. So you can see the name of the M charts and the container name was Falco. It was the main container. And uh, we will have a list of functionalities. So here we have only one example. It's uh, Funk21, but we have hundreds of these checks. And for example, here we check that the container should not be privileged. It's recommended by uh, most checkers. But we can see the value is set to false because the checker, so our tool, the functionality Oracle, uh, flags the permission as uh, required. Otherwise, the container won't start. So we can see that TC1 uh, actually failed. So I will now show some findings uh, on the data set of the 60 M charts that we used. So here are the names of the charts that required the highest number of functionalities. In particular, we can find Falco with eight permission, Longhorn with seven permission, and finally RabbitMQ and Promptail with five permission needed. 
So for example, for Falco, it requires, uh, it, we cannot uh, change the ULD value, otherwise it will fail, and it's the same for all of the other charts. Uh, the same appears for changing the GID value. We can see also that the Longhorn uh, pod needs to be privileged, and that uh, Falco and Longhorn uh, M charts uh, needs to get the privileged escalation. Uh, also, for each of these charts, you can see the number of Linux capabilities that are needed. So, by default, uh, containers are granted uh, 14 capabilities. Uh, and we check with the same process which Linux capabilities were actually needed by the chart to function and which one from the 14 we can actually remove. So on average, um, for one chart, 2.21 permission were actually required for each container. So it's a good result because it means we can uh, actually deny many permissions to make the configuration more secure. And in terms of Linux capabilities, so for the non-privileged containers, uh, we can see that on average only 1.16 uh, capabilities are needed uh, out of the 14 granted by default. And for privileged containers, uh, they are granted 14.1 capabilities by default, and on average only four of them were needed. Another result, uh, here we ask ourselves which are the functionalities that are needed most of the time. So you can see on the left uh, the results. So the first one is uh, changing the high UID value. So to prevent containers from accessing us files, most checkers tools um, ask us to use high UID value, but actually it makes the configuration fail for uh, 26 containers application will not uh, work anymore. Then we have the same for the using uh, root uh, user uh, to put the file system as read-only and to unmoon the service account tokens. So we also saw that we have a limited set of permissions that makes the functionality breaks often, so it can enable to weaken the process to first focus on this limited set. And we did the same on the right uh, to see the required Linux capabilities that are most likely uh, needed for the application to function. And the top one was the uh, NetBind uh, service Linux capability that is required for seven containers. So I will now leave the floor to Francesco for the rest. Yes. So. Uh for the misconfigurations instead, uh, these are the 10 most common misconfigurations that we found. Uh, again, it was on the data set of uh, charts from Artifact App. So of course, if you run it on your uh, configuration files, the result can be different. But we found that uh, uh, dangerous uh, cluster roles, memory limit, missing memory limits, and uh, using the default namespace are the three most common misconfigurations. Um, and in terms of tools, instead, we also found that uh, these uh, seven tools perform significantly different. And uh, on our data set, data tree, data tree was the one that found most misconfigurations on average. Uh, Kubelinter actually has no policy that breaks any functionality. Uh, and finally, Kix is the one that found most uh, remaining misconfigurations. That means. It is the tool with most unique uh, policies, so it was actually the one finding a lot of misconfigurations that uh, other tools could not uh, detect. Um, so before we conclude, a list of uh, recommendations from us uh, to you when you uh, deal with configurations uh, files. Uh, we really recommend uh, to scan your configurations, but first, you should create a, a, a framework to standardize the policies of these tools because there are several inconsistencies and if you don't do that, then you're, you can have um, a false negative uh, results uh, that are not uh, shown in the output. Um, so first, standardize the policies of these tools and also uh, have a clear definition of what is a misconfiguration in your environment, uh, what is a mitigation for it, and what is instead a functionality? Because uh, in my environment, uh, what can be a misconfiguration can be actually a functionality in your, in your system. Uh, we also recommend to use one, then more than one tool, 
and also to define custom policies exactly for the reason that every environment is, is different. Uh, and finally, as Agathe was also showing before, there is uh, on average a very uh, limited set of functionalities that you need on average. So we recommend you to start from those and then uh, move on instead of looking at the whole uh, set. So uh, last uh, slide, um, uh, answering the question of the title of this talk, how far are we from automated detection and mitigation in, uh, with configuration files? I think we are still pretty far, uh, unfortunately, um, because we found that uh, they, uh, such tools, they still require uh, uh, quite a significant amount of manual uh, work uh, to uh, both uh, understand the output and uh, mostly to, to actually remove the misconfigurations. Uh, and then we also found inconsistencies uh, in terms of uh, a configuration that satisfy one tool but do not satisfy another tool. Um, and finally, uh, some uh, also posi uh, false positive and uh, neg negative results uh, from the tools. So there is a long way ahead, uh, but um, I think uh, I'm optimistic. <laughs> so I think uh, standardizing, standardization is really what we need as a first step. And uh, I think as a, as a community, we can uh, start from there and have more uh, secure configurations. That was it. Uh, thank you for uh, listening and joining.